comes out of the Gospel of Luke, the 21st chapter, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 19. So hear now the Word of God. Some people were talking about the temple, how it was decorated with beautiful stones and ornaments dedicated to God. And Jesus said, as for these things you are admiring, the time is coming when not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. They asked him, teacher, when will these things happen? What sign will show that these things are about to happen? Jesus said, watch out that you aren't deceived. Many will come in my name saying, I am the one, and it's time. Don't follow them. When you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. These things must happen first, but the end won't happen immediately. Then Jesus said to him, nations and kingdoms will fight against each other. There will be great earthquake. There will be great earthquakes and wide-scale food shortages and epidemics. There will also be terrifying sights and great signs in the sky. But before all this occurs, they will take you into custody and harass you because of your faith. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will provide you with an opportunity to testify. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. I'll give you words and wisdoms that none of your opponents will be able to counter or contradict. You'll be betrayed by your parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. They will execute some of you. Everyone will hate you because of my name. Still, not a hair on your heads will be lost. By holding fast, you will gain your life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and to know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today, now, and always. Amen. So the picture on the screen is uh, two of my sisters and one of their friends. And the joy of having three younger sisters is you get to be a proud older brother. The picture um, shows them as they're getting ready to run the Baltimore Marathon. And so the one in the middle is my middle sister, the second one down. And then the first one over on on here on the left is Jody. She is my youngest sister. I don't want to talk about the Baltimore Marathon, though, in 2015. I want to talk about another race. A race that Jody did in May 19, 2012. Early in the morning, she took off on a running adventure. For many years, both Jean and Jody and my sister Julie, even my mom, they would run in many uh, um, races for team and training, which is a group that raises money for uh, leukemia and lymphoma research, a cancer that my grandfather had. I have no clue how many marathon and half marathons and 10Ks they have run, but that morning in May of 2012, it was different. Jody finished the first 25 miles that morning in six hours and 26 minutes, but then kept going. She finished the next 25 miles in seven hours and 53 minutes, but then kept going. 14 hours and 19 minutes in, she passed the halfway point in her first ultra marathon, the Keys 100. Yes, you heard me right, 100, meaning 100 miles. For months and months and months, she had trained and planned and was ready to run 100 miles. She passed the 75-mile mark in 24 hours and 6 minutes. Now it was May 20th, 2012. And she saw the sunrise at mile 76. She had run for a solid day straight. And her body was feeling it. Her legs were cramping up and her feet were killing her. And at mile marker 80, she listened to what her body was screaming. And she pulled out of the race. Now as I talked to her this week, asked her permission to, one, show a picture. I didn't ask my middle sister. Maybe she'll find out. But I asked Jody if I could use her as a sermon illustration. And she mentioned that someday she hopes to go back and pick up the rest of the race. 
to finish, her dream is to finish the last 20 miles. I looked at her results, and whether she finished the race or not, I mean, I was massively impressed. She finished 80 miles. To put that into perspective, that's running from here to the north part of Mount Airy, about three miles shy of the Virginia border. Try to envision doing that. To do any sort of running, you need something special, or maybe a little wonky. You need to kind of disconnect that thing in your brain that tells you to stop doing what you're doing. As I did research on other ultramarathon runners, many of them said it was very common that they were, you know, uh, 50 miles into a race, and they have visions of running next to a donut next to them and a taco in front of them. And they just thought, you know what, that's normal. My sister and people who participate in these races have great endurance. These aren't runners. These are endurance racers. Endurance is, when we think about it in exercise terms, is defined as the ability to gather and to process and to deliver oxygen. It's a processing, it's a process of making our bodies keep going. Endurance is also defined as the ability to withstand hardship or adversity. And there are people who have great endurance, but couldn't even run a quarter of a mile. These are people who have endured great hardships in their lives and who have overcome great, unimaginable adversity. This person, Nelson Mandela, was in prison for 27 years. He was sent there because he was an adversary of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Apartheid was the government system set up in 1948 which segregated the population of South Africa. Each person was given a classification back then. You were either white, black, colored, or Indian. And eventually, those classified as black were forcefully removed and placed in camps outside of cities. They were allowed to come into the city, you know, to work and to serve the whites who lived in there. But other than that, they lived in some of the poorest conditions and under some of the cruelest treatment by, that you can imagine by their government. There were those who attempted to fight this regime, and they were thrown away into prison, if not killed. But after being in prison for 27 years, being behind bars, Nelson Mandela was freed and became the first president in 1994, elected through multiracial elections. In those 27 years in prison, he learned a lot. He learned to have compassion for his adversaries, and in the end, to have South Africa be a country as a whole, not just one who has a black president. One of the traits that enabled him to go from prisoner to president is his endurance, his ability to withstand hardship and adversity. The scripture ends today by Jesus saying, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. In this passage of Luke, Jesus is in the temple. In the beginning of the, uh, chapter 21, he uh, witnesses a woman putting two small copper coins into the offering. And then overhears some people talking about how pretty the temple is. And the temple was extremely gorgeous. It was breathtaking. In 19 BC, King Herod started to rebuild the temple. And during this capital campaign, the property almost doubled in size. The construction of the temple only lasted 18 months, which is just phenomenal, whether you're doing that in 2022 or way back when. But they were still working on the adornments, all the little flourishes, the decorations, when Jesus comes in in chapter 21 of Luke's gospel. They didn't finish the temple until either somewhere between 62 and 64 AD. The temple was a beautiful place. But when Jesus hears them talking about the beauty, he tells them, for these things that you have seen, that you see, the day will come when no stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. This prophecy would not have been taken lightly, and nor was it. Because remember, the temple is where the Spirit of God was. God's presence was in the holies of holies. The temple for the Jews is not only just represents a place for them to make sacrifices to God, but is also where God lived. For many, the temple probably was God. Jesus is now telling them that this building, 
this beautiful, ornate, religious building would crumble and no stone left unturned. This piqued people's interest. They wanted to know more. And so they came up and said, Teacher, when will this be? And what kind of sign that is going to, uh, what kind of sign will take place that will tell us this is happening? So then Jesus goes on to answer those questions, but in some very kind of sketchy language. Many people read this piece of scripture and they think that Jesus is predicting the end of times. And if you look at other gospels around this period and and this conversation, they, they may depict it at a little bit. But here in Luke, he is really telling people about the end of the temple. In reality, the author of the Gospel of Luke knows what really happens because it is thought that Luke is written after 70 AD when Jerusalem and the temple were actually destroyed by the Romans. So so let's look at the scripture. So if you have your Bible with you or if you have your phone that has a Bible app, take it out. There's one in the pews or if you're at home, go grab one right quick and open up to Luke 21 verses 5 through 19 and read along as I kind of talk about the different prophecies that Jesus says are signs that this is about to happen. Jesus states that before the destruction of the temple, there'll be war and insurrections. The Roman Empire, at the, the emperor at the time of Jesus' death was Tiberius. Between Tiberius and and the siege of Jerusalem, there were eight different Roman emperors. So eight different Roman emperors in 40 years. Because of this high volume of turnover and the, and the struggles that came as a new person takes over for control of the empire, there were many wars and insurrection, people battling for power. Jesus mentions, as you see there, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Once again, this wasn't supposed to be taking place at the end time prophecy, but at the end of the temple prophecy. While the Roman Empire fought over who was controlled what and who was emperor, kingdoms and nations, they fought against each other all the time. Jesus then goes on to mention earthquakes, famines, and plagues. In Claudia, in 47 AD, there was a massive famine in the land. The second part of Luke's gospel, which we call the book of Acts, tells us in the 11th chapter about the famine itself and how it led to destruction around the area. Then in chapter 16 of the same book, we learn about a massive earthquake in Philippi. It was so massive that it shook the foundation of a prison that Paul and Silas were in and set everyone free, although they didn't escape. They merely hung around and worshiped God during that time. Jesus also mentions there'll be signs in heaven. During the siege of Jerusalem, the Roman commander Titus had enlisted help of Josephus, a Jewish scholar, to try to and negotiate with the people in the temple walls in order to reach kind of a peaceful agreement. So Josephus also kept detailed account of the siege and destruction. During this time, they reported a star in the sky that resembled a sword and a comet that appeared, too, during the burning of Jerusalem. Everything that Jesus had said came true in one way or another before the commander Titus destroyed the city and the temple. After they had plundered the temple, taking artifacts and anything else and carrying it off back to Rome, there's actually still an arch called the Arch of Titus, this huge stone arch which honors the Roman uh, Titus in the Roman Forum. And there is a carving on that arch that depicts the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem. You can go to Rome and see it for yourself. I am sure everyone who is standing around Jesus as he talks about these things were very concerned. Jesus then goes on and goes a little bit further. He tells them they'll be persecuted and hated and it will tear at the very fabric of society and family structures. During this time, the early Christians had massive persecutions under this emperor named Nero. Nero was well known for just simply torturing Christians and using Christians as basically citronella candles to scare off bugs at parties. Many Christians suffered a great deal for their faith between Jesus' death and the destruction of the temple. Jesus knows what is coming, and he's looking around at his disciples And to the people standing there in the temple, and he says, by your endurance, you will gain your souls. 
The Christian faith was so fresh, just happened, that it'd be easy to dismiss and just kind of move on with life. No one would blame Peter if he would have just kept on denying knowing this guy named Jesus that he used to hang out with, especially when things got to the point of life and death. Peter himself, he was said to have died at the, at the hands of Nero by being crucified upside down in Rome. This is why the Vatican, the holy city of the Roman Catholic Church, is located there, and Peter's grave is in the foundation of that basilica. There were people who walked with Jesus, heard this, his message, saw his death, witnessed the resurrection as a young person, and then lived to witness the destruction that came to Jerusalem in the temple within their own lifetime. During a time of trial, during a time of persecution, of natural disaster, and of civil unrest, faith can be easily lost. But those who understood the, natural, the nature of spiritual endurance, Jesus says they will gain their souls. Desmond Tutu is the, a bishop during apartheid in South Africa. He then moved to become the Secretary General of South Africa's church, uh, Council of Churches. He became the central church figure in the fight against apartheid. After apartheid ended, he was also the person in charge of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened there in South Africa. During this commission, people would come and share their stories about what happened during apartheid. And so Bishop Tutu heard thousands of stories of people being tortured families being killed, and all the pain and suffering that went along with this horrible regime. He heard this from the victims, but also from the perpetrators. As he listened to these stories, he saw plenty of evil. And he also saw plenty of good in people. And was able to speak to the notion that good will always win over evil. In Time Magazine, he is quoted by saying, God is not even-handed. God is biased horribly in favor of the weak. The minute injustice is perpetuated, God is going to be on the side of those who is being clobbered. Now with this mindset that God is on your side, knowing that as Jesus says, not not a hair on your head will perish, it is possible to live to such horrible things. Only through the faith in Jesus Christ is it possible to look at evil in the eye and know for certain who will come out the victor. Tutu also said in the Time Magazine article, the texture of our universe is one where there is no question at all but that good and laughter and justice will prevail. He is known as the laughing bishop because of his infectious laugh. But that laugh, it was rooted in the knowledge that no matter how bad things get, and he saw horrible things, God will win. We too are currently living through a tough time. And there are many people suffering in our city and in our nation and in our world. We have to continue to endure. We have to keep breathing and keep pumping oxygen of faith into our system. We don't know how long the run will be. We don't know how long the pain and the suffering will last. It could be a couple of miles. It could be a hundred miles. When the temple fell, so did the faith of many people in that holy city. But as we look at our lives, and some of it crumbles, we have to know that things may not get better. They may even get worse. But with God... God will eventually win. We may die, but the ultimate defeat goes to sin and death because the battle has already been won by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the foundation of our faith and the one that helps us endure absolutely anything. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. But there are many of us who are going through a lot. We are going through extremely hard times. These things could be physically, 
These things could be happening to us emotionally or mentally. These things can be, even be spiritually. Whatever we are going through, we give you thanks that you walk with us. May we sense the presence of your Holy Spirit that wraps us up in care and love. And may that give us faith, an enduring faith, to continue to put one foot in front of the other. To keep moving. To keep going. And to live a life that shows the world that we have faith in you. For you are our God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.